Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another video. This one's going to be about uh, Latin America and the problems that they've experienced in development. Uh, this is going to be the last one in the series about the developing world in the modern era. So let's dive right in. Uh, if you find this video to be useful to you, make sure you hit like, hit subscribe for the notifications for when the new videos come out. Leave any comments or questions down below in the comments. Uh, hit me up on Google Classroom or shoot me an email and uh, let's get started. So we're looking today at uh, Latin America which of course is what we refer to as the Spanish-speaking portion of the New World, plus of course the country of Brazil. Uh, it's 33 countries, and of course the vast majority of them are considered to be what we call developing countries, because of course they have a lot of the same characteristics as what we have associated with other developing countries so far in this particular unit, uh, which of course is very large population growth, very high illiteracy rates, high levels of poverty, quite a bit of political instability, and of course, occasionally we'll even see some authoritarian governments in there. So let's dive in. We're going to look kind of in a, in a generalized overview first, and then we'll jump into a couple of specific countries and their particular historical issues. So the first issue across this particular region is economic. Economically, one of the things that we see which is a concern for Latin America is Latin America focuses a lot of its production predominantly on what we call cash crops. And so here we have four different examples, of course. Um, in the upper left, you've got coffee, which of course is, is predominantly produced throughout the entire region, particularly at the higher elevations. We also see things like cotton and fruit of different kinds. And then of course, sugarcane, particularly uh, focused around the Caribbean. Now, agribusiness is a huge uh, component of the economic production of these companies. However, a lot of times, political power goes along with control and ownership of those agribusinesses and quite often a lot of those agribusinesses are owned by foreign companies which really you know produces a situation in Latin America where they themselves really don't own or control very large portions of their own economies and of their own production also what that tends to mean is they tend to be what we refer to as banana republics which is not necessarily that they all produce bananas but what that means is these countries in Latin America generally tend to focus on the production of one or two major products exclusively for export and then they run their entire economies and their entire countries off of the profits generated by those one or two particular products. Now that's okay if the product is really you know expensive if it's something like oil that's that's you know not the worst thing in the world however when we see products especially agricultural products like these cash crops one of the things you have to realize is that the value of these products changes dramatically and rapidly and when your entire economy is based exclusively off of the production of these particular types of products that really doesn't set your economy up for tremendous amounts of sustainable, long-term, consistent growth. Your economy in, in Latin America tends to fluctuate wildly. Now, one of the really big problems with that, of course, is also when times are good, it, governments in this particular region don't invest large portions of their income into things like education and technological development and continuing industrialization. And so really what we see is they've tried a strategy which is called import substitution industrialization where the additional profit taken from cash crops is taken by the government and reinvested into the economy to help build up local and domestic manufacturing and industry and education and technology. However, one of the problems that we see is quite often in Latin America, we have seen the rise of governments, which we refer to as kleptocracies, which means governments based on theft. And so when the, when the government takes in large amounts of taxation money from the exporting of things like sugarcane, quite often people in that government or even the leaders of those governments will simply steal that money and then eventually when they're overthrown they'll leave the country take the wealth with them and leave the country in absolute shambles so economically we've seen that that Latin America as a region struggles tremendously with these problems of things like cash cropping the the underdevelopment of their economies the the outright theft of quite a lot of their wealth 
sometimes even by their own governments, um, which, which again, doesn't really set the region up for tremendous economic or otherwise success. Now, the second economic problem that we see throughout Latin America is one that we should probably by this time expect, which is slums. Lots and lots and lots of people living in slums. In Latin America, however, we do have a particular term for these slums. They are referred to as favelas. And this particular one that we're looking at here is called Rocina favela, which is in Rio de Janeiro in South America. This particular example is actually the largest slum in the world, uh, which is called Neza Chaco Itza, uh, which is in Mexico City. Uh, for some reason, and I've never really understood this, but Latin American people just for some reason really love to live in their capital city. So when you see uh, Latin American countries, uh, a humongous population, a portion of their population, sometimes almost 50% of their population lives just in their capital city. And then as a result of that, we see these massively expanding, uh, you know, expansive uh slums and favelas in Latin America right in the capital city. So this particular one is actually in Mexico City. So this is only about a three-hour plane ride from, from most parts of the United States. And, and again, it's it's absolutely enormous. The population of, of um, Nesa Chalco Itza is actually over a million people living just in this particular slum or favela inside of Mexico City itself. So that, of course, is another problem, and of course, that leads into the problem of poverty and cyclical, multi-generational poverty, uh, which also comes down to the cash cropping issue, and of course, all of these things put a tremendous stress and strain on the people of Latin America, and it's a really major issue. Now, moving on from just pure economics, we also see that Latin America is defined by and also a predominant uh, component of the world when it comes to religion because of course overwhelmingly in Latin America most people tend to be Roman Catholic. Now this actually is interesting because starting in the 1960s one of the things that we have seen coming from Latin America is a different style of religious ideology where Catholics predominantly in Latin America have focused themselves on um, different sorts of issues when it comes to what is the function of the Catholic Church. And, and in Latin America, they developed an idea which was called liberation theology, which is the idea that the religion should actively be in place, the Catholic religion in particular, should actively be in place to improve the lives of the regular people living in the country and to help stand up for them and to secure their rights and to work as an active agent of change for the good of particularly the least advantaged people. And what's really interesting about this, of course, is that the current Pope of the Catholic Church started his uh, uh, religious life and his professional life as a Catholic priest in the slums of South America. And as a result of that, as the, as the Pope now, he's really focused a lot of attention on changing the doctrine and belief and practice in the Catholic Church to really more specifically focus on this concept of liberation theology. Now, when liberation theology was in place, that actually led to large problems within Latin America as well, because at the same time that this liberation theology was going on, we also see that politically, from the 1950s all the way through the 1990s, in many Latin American countries, we had armed military overthrows of the political system and of the government. And in Latin America, we actually refer to these military governments as juntas, which is J-U-N-T-A-S, juntas. Uh, juntas took over in places like Argentina, very famously in Argentina and Brazil and Chile, Nicaragua. We, we see m many, many, many places where the militaries of the government, of, of the countries decided that the government was incapable of managing things. And so a general or officers within the military simply overthrew the government and took direct control. Now, the problem with that is that these particular military juntas, these governments, were generally okay, always very, very repressive. They took people's rights away. They were absolutely brutal with their political rivals and opponents. And, and they really just set up their own little dictatorships. And one of the things that these dictatorships were quite often based on and their power revolved around is something that was literally officially referred to as death squads. 
death squads were official government agencies that were set up to deal with political opposition movements. And so literally these people would walk into a, to a private residence, take someone who the government didn't like, and just absolutely completely murder them. Uh, the process was sometimes referred to as disappearing. The government would disappear you, and you would just absolutely disappear because the government didn't like you and didn't want your political uh, speech being done anymore. And, and again, this is something that was very, very typical in Latin America all throughout the middle and the end of the 20th century. Where again, these death squads were not even secret anymore. And of course, one of the things you have to realize is when these guys are working for the government, what is it that a private citizen is supposed to do? If they come to my house and they kidnap my my loved one and they murder them, I can't call the police because they are the police. And, and so again, politically, this, this kind of repressive system was devastating to the people of Latin America. Beyond the military juntas, we also see, of course, from the 50s all the way through the 1990s, Marxist or communist guerrilla movements springing up throughout Latin America. Latin America was a major battleground during the Cold War because, of course, both the United States and, the, and NATO and the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact wanted to have these satellite states, these these regional alliances, and Latin America was hugely important for the Soviet Union. So we see people, of course, like the guy we're looking at here, whose name was Che Guevara. Che Guevara, of course, was a Marxist revolutionary who helped to spread communist revolutions throughout Latin America and, in fact, Africa as well. Now, that, of course, led to a huge problem because, of course, since the 1800s, the United States has maintained a policy called the Monroe Doctrine, which essentially says Latin America is the United States' sphere of influence. This is our backyard, and European countries should not come here to retake their colonies and to try to set up their you know, domination, because ultimately that's the United States' job, is to dominate and control Latin America. At least that's how the United States has behaved for you know most of the last 200 years. So let's see some specific examples of these particular issues in the region when it comes to individual countries and kind of how they played out within those individual countries. So we'll start with a very small country country of El Salvador. Uh, from 1979 to 1992, El Salvador actually went through a revolution uh, which was in direct opposition to the domination of their country by the United States. They went through an anti-American revolution. Uh, but because the revolutionaries themselves were anti American, the, it was very difficult for them to get assistance and to get aid from other people in trying to change their country for what they thought was the better. And so, of course, when they were looking for support and for assistance, one of the places that they went to to find that assistance was the Soviet Union. And because of how important uh, the United States was and how important the uh, El Salvador was to the United States, the Soviet Union was more than willing to help the people of El Salvador in overthrowing the system of government that existed there and trying to get them to be within the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union. So, of course, the Soviet Union did send them equipment and, and train, you know, they helped to train some of their people and they, they, they provided assistance where they could. The problem with that, though, is throughout the 70s and the 80s and even into the 1990s, when the United States saw that the Soviet Union was funding these communist guerrillas in places like El Salvador, we labeled them as communist revolutionaries, and it was within the context of the Cold War that we decided that we needed to take action to try to stop them, and El Salvador is a really excellent example of this. Inside of El Salvador, interestingly enough, a lot of these issues get tied together because, of course, we had a guy named Archbishop Oscar Romero, who, who was a, a Catholic bishop and an archbishop uh, within El Salvador. And one of the things that he did was he used the concept of liberation theology to become what, he ref what we refer to as the voice of the voiceless. And he really started to speak out for the poor people of El Salvador. He started to represent their interests and to oppose the military governments who were trying to brutally crack down on them. However, on March the 24th of 1980, he was, he was uh, getting ready to 
uh, celebrate Mass within his own church when a government death squad actually walked into uh, his chapel, which was called La Divina Providencia. And uh, during his sermon, uh, he was outright shot and fatally murdered right in the middle of Mass. However, when the people went to the government and said, you know, Archbishop Romero, this, this great symbol of peace and the guy who's really trying to improve things for our, for our people has been murdered in his own church, the government, when they, when, they, when they started to research and investigate this, of course, and they knew darn well that it was their own death squad that had done it, to this day, no one has ever been charged with or, or been sent to prison for the outright murder of not only a Catholic priest, but also an archbishop who was standing up for the rights of the people of his own country, murdered on his own altar. Um, to this day, no one has been accountable for that. And again, it shows you the problems of things like corruption and you know control and repression in a country like El Salvador, and this is generally true throughout Latin America. Beyond that, of course, when it came to the communist insurgency in, in uh, El Salvador, uh, the United States actually did get directly involved. And of course, what this led to was not only death squads, but also American assistance to these death squads in exterminating whole villages full of people, which of course were then later buried in mass graves. And actually to this day, all the way up to 2020, there are still people down there who are trying to separate out individual bodies so that they are allowed an actual burial inside of El Salvador. El Salvador. So this, this country really gives us a really good example of how Cold War politics play into the consequences and in, play into and create consequences for Latin American countries. Things like military juntas, things like liberation theology, all of those things are wrapped up. And of course, the Monroe Doctrine and the involvement of the United States, all of those things are wrapped up and involved in just this one small country of El Salvador. Beyond that, the next country on our list is Nicaragua. Uh, Nicaragua also had a communist revolution uh, against the, uh, which was called the Sandinista government, which was, of course, a communist sympathizing government. Well, the United States decided that we didn't want a communist government in Nicaragua, and so the United States started to fund what were called the Contras, or the uh, counter-communist forces in Nicaragua. However, in order to fund this group, the United States actually had to uh, do something which most people don't think was necessarily the most positive thing, because Congress refused to support these Contra rebels, these anti-communist rebels in Nicaragua. The government had to figure out a way, and the CIA had to figure out a way of supplying them with what they needed while not being able to do so officially. And so what the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, did was they decided to create a system whereby they could raise their own money without asking Congress for it in order to fund the Contras. So the way that this worked was a, a member, a agents of the American government sold guns to Iran, to Iran first. Using that money, they then provided cash to the Contras who turned around and used that cash to sell a product back to the CIA, which was drugs. The CIA then took the drug money to buy more weapons. Those weapons were then sold to revolutionaries in Iran. That money was then sent to the Contras in exchange for drugs, which then was used to buy more guns. And of course, this entire uh, event became called the Iran-Contra affair because, of course, the CIA was illegally selling both guns and drugs to fund anti-communist uh, movements in Latin America. So again, we see this Monroe Doctrine and this involvement of the United States not always being the most positive thing, but this is this is one of the things that happened is that the the Latin American people were kind of used as pawns in the larger battleground of the Cold War, and Nicaragua is absolutely a, a great example of that. Now, finally, we're going to deal with the country of Mexico, our, our closest neighbor and our closest ally in the region as well. Um, one of the things to understand about Mexico is it's a very complex and complicated place, and it's got some really major problems. Even though it's really one of the most developed countries in Latin America, st they still have some really, really, really significant problems. So one of their problems was from 1929 until the year 2000, Mexico itself was actually governed by only one political party, which was called the PRI, the, the basically the Revolutionary Party, the Party of Permanent Revolution, um, or the Party of Institutionalized Revolution. And th this was a party that really came from the Mexican Revolution itself. 
In 2000, the PRI, the, the PRI, lost its control in the, the presidential election of 2000. And since then, we've seen some loss of stability in the Mexican government because, of course, we have a multi-party democracy where occasionally, every couple of years, the, the control over the government will shift from one party to another. Now, that has helped to uh, create more discussion and more, pure, you know, more real democracy inside of Mexico, which is good, but it's also made some problems in Mexico much more difficult to deal with. So one of those problems, of course, is migration. Mexico, of course, has, has up, up until very recently, had very, very open borders, and a lot of people, not only from Mexico itself, but also from the rest of Latin America, have migrated across Mexico to come to the United States, sometimes legally, some very often illegally. And of course, the estimates right now are about 11.5 million people are in the United States illegally, again, predominantly from Latin America. And again, quite a lot of those people came to the United States illegally. But of course, one of the things that we have to be very careful of is we should not really blame the illegal immigrants themselves for coming to the United States because when we think about the conditions in Latin America, you know, the idea that they could simply, you know, walk across the border and hopefully get a chance at a better life, or they're going to be stuck in this kind of cycle of poverty that we have seen in the developing world and in Latin America itself, is it's a huge draw. And, and, and again, it, it's something that that it should be acknowledged that these people are in very bad positions. Not that illegal immigration is necessarily the best option uh, for, for anybody, both for the United States and for the immigrants themselves, because of course it leads to a great deal of exploitation. There are people that run, run uh, illegal operations across the border between the United States and Mexico ca called coyotes. And the second picture there, the x-ray picture there that you can see, was actually taken from a truck where each of those people had paid about $200 U.S. to be be smuggled into the United States. However, the coyote who was running this truck got nervous and decided that he was going to bail out. And when he bailed out, he left the truck parked next to the road with all of the people, you know, crated up inside. And they were ultimately not found until about a week later. Uh, of course, they were all deceased because they'd been locked inside of this box. And so, of course, the, the, the exploitation that takes place here is something which is absolutely horrific and horrendous and something which really, you know, needs to be addressed on both sides of the border border, both from the Mexican side and from the United States side. But this is one of the situations and one of the realities of the current situation in Mexico is that, uh, of course, the immigration issue becomes a big one. S next, of course, for Mexico is drugs. Uh, drugs are a humongous issue industry and also a humongous problem inside of Mexico. And for about the last 15 years, what we've seen inside of the country of Mexico is actually a drug war between not only the different cartels, but also between all of those cartels in the government of Mexico. And because the cartels have so incredibly much funding because of the enormous demand for drugs, particularly in the United States, what we see is that these, these drug cartels are so incredibly well funded that the government of Mexico has a very difficult time dealing with them and mitigating those problems. Each of the photographs here that I'm showing you is actually from a single drug bust inside of Mexico. At the top left, you can see uh, five kilogram bricks of marijuana getting ready for export into the United States. And again, that's just from one particular drug bus. So you can see that that's an enormous quantity of drugs coming across the border, you know, just in one particular shipment. And these shipments come all day long, every day, time after time after time. Uh, despite the interdiction efforts of both the United States and Mexico, this continues to be a major problem. The next picture next to it, of course, is gigantic stacks of cash, uh, all from you know illegal drug operations and money laundering operations. You see the weaponry that these folks have available, uh, and again, all of these are single are single uh, busts. Uh, beyond that, you see the gigantic bricks of marijuana production. Um, again, this this is a major issue, and dealing with these drug cartels is a huge problem for the central government of Mexico, who is very very underfunded when compared to uh, the the cartels themselves. Finally, we're going to deal with one of my 
favorite countries in the whole world and absolutely one of my favorite countries in Latin America, which is the country of Argentina. Now, Argentina, of course, went through a very similar cycle to what we've seen in other countries. From 1946 to 1955, they were under the dictatorship of a man named Juan Perón. Uh, he was a socialist and a nationalist, although he wasn't a Nazi, which is interesting. He was a nationalist. He, he was in favor of, of Argentine nationalism, but also, of course, he was a socialist and believed in workers' rights and the redistribution of wealth and land. Um, he was removed in 1955, and following that, Argentina started to go through a cycle of military dictatorships. And of course, the one, you know, one government, or I'm uh, sorry, one uh, military officer would decide that he didn't like the person in charge and would start his own uh, military overthrow. And that cycle continued on and on and on from 1955 all the way up through the 1990s. From 1976 until 1983, the military junta, the government of Argentina, violently cracked down on all of their opposition inside of the country, and this started what we refer to as the Dirty War. They targeted communists, they targeted people who didn't support them, they targeted liberal people, they targeted people who just believed in rights, they targeted anybody that disagreed and tried to stop them. As the estimates now are, as many as 30,000 people were disappeared by their own government. Starting in 1977, a group of women named uh, who are called the Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo began to protest because of the disappearance of their own children. And eventually, in the 1980s, these protests became so enormous, and, and again, they would hang pictures of their loved ones up, um, that, that eventually this, this helped to generate a popular uprising against the government. The last thing we've got to deal with for Argentina, of course, is in 1983, uh, as a result of the nationalism of the government, they decided that they were going to seize a set of islands off the eastern coast of Argentina called the Malvinas in, in Spanish, or they're also referred to as the Falkland Islands. Now, the problem with the Falkland Islands is they're not tremendously important. In fact, the population of sheep in the Falkland Islands is much larger than the population of people, but Argentina took this as a statement of national pride and of national identity that they were going to retake these islands that they felt were right, rightfully theirs from the British Empire. Now the problem is what they didn't count on was the British at the time were being led by a woman named Margaret Thatcher, who we sometimes refer to as the Iron Lady. And Margaret Thatcher was not about to be pushed around by the British. And so in 1983, she went to, in 1982 and 1983, she decided to go to war against the government of Argentina to retake the Falklands and was ultimately successful. What this did, of course, is it put Argentina in an incredibly bad economic position, which, again, the cycle of poverty and the cycle of instability continues in Argentina all the way up until this day. Political left and political right are constantly hounding after each other. It's it's really, it's a country with lots and lots of untapped potential. So I hope that this that these, these examples of countries has given you a little more insight into how uh, Latin America itself works, some of their problems, historically how things have developed there. Uh, if this has been good for you, leave a like down below. Make sure you smash that subscribe button to get notifications for the new videos. Uh, leave a comment, you know, hit me up on, on uh, email or on Google classroom. Uh, stay healthy and stay safe, everybody, and I will see you in the next video.